folks finally after what i guess a century or more congress passed anti-lynching legislation the emmett till act and the president signed it into law and while we know the story of emmett till we also know historically another individual who played a tremendous role in reporting on chronicling and making us aware of the proliferation of lynchings in America was the great Ida B. Wells. We're honored now to be joined by her great grandchildren, sister and brother, Michelle Duster and Dan Duster. Welcome you both to Make It Plain. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And so, well, first of all, let's start this way. Um, Michelle, I saw you. I didn't see. The, Dan, were you at the, the uh, White House signing, too? Were you both there? Yes. You were there. I'm sorry. I didn't see you. So yeah. what, what, was, what was that like? How did that, that feel to be a part of that, Michelle? It was an amazing honor um, that I'm still processing actually happened. <laughs> um I mean, I was I was asked to to participate. Well, I was asked to go, and I thought I'd just be in the audience. And then I was asked to speak, and then I was asked to um, that that Joe Biden would would introduce me. So it just kept getting more surreal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about how about you, Dan? What was that like? Oh, I said it was incredible. Um, and Michelle and I were, were traveling together, and she kept looking at her at her text and was like, "Wait a minute, what?" <laughs> like, look at this. Like, okay, now they want me to introduce President Biden. But now he's going to introduce me, and then I'm going to introduce Kamala Harris. So it was, <laughs> it was a very, so the, the, the whole process was phenomenal from the, the excitement of the buildup. Uh, being there was incredible. Uh, going into the Oval Office and, you know, shaking hands, taking pictures with President Biden and uh, Vice President Harris was absolutely uh, incredible. And then being in, in the uh, garden, and looking up so you know the camera's looking at us which you know the stage looks pretty cool but looking out into the audience which the cameras don't capture was absolutely incredible to see that the number of people there and the number um the the, 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 the members of congressional black caucus and, and other congress members who were there so just a, a really awesome experience so i, I have to ask because i'm i'm not sure was I, I guess i would assume not but i just have to ask is was your great grandmother Ida B. Wells ever invited to the White House? Yes, she actually visited the White House um, more than once. One okay. to um, talk with President McKinley in 1898 about um, implementing legislation regarding um, making lynching a federal crime, and she went in 1914, I think it was, to visit. Um, President Woodrow Wilson um, to uh, encourage him to stop resegregating the federal government. Um, so she actually has talked to two sitting presidents at the White House. That's that's amazing. And you you mentioned her speaking to McKinley about anti lynching legislation. This this was a crusade of your great grandmothers. This was the manifestation of something that she started, right, Dan? The, the new legislation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I said, um, she, 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 she started it uh, 1898 and you know was, was an advocate for it for years until her death. And so let's educate our audience a bit about your great grandmother's role, Michelle. And of course, uh, Michelle has written um, two books. Um, and the most recent one, this, this is past January, January, Ida B. Wells, Voice of Truth last year, Ida B. Queen, Ida B. The Queen, The Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells, available wherever books are sold. Folks, you should read about that. But uh, let's walk through a bit of your great grandmother's history and the impact she had on 
the anti-lynching movement, Michelle? Well, one could argue she um, either started or was greatly in influential in um, uplifting the, the um, fight for against the lynching. Um, after, in 1892, after three of her friends were killed in Memphis, they owned a grocery store and they were killed for basically being successful while black. Um, she uh, started writing about what happened to her friends and then she investigated other lynchings um, and then she eventually got run out of Memphis because she was being so vocal and then she just took her whole crusade um, international. She ended up going to um, the United Kingdom and then all over the United States um, informing people about what was actually happening in the South, mostly in the South. And if, 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 if memory serves, Dan, she even uh, published, uh, she did a lot of writing and, and she published really a, a list, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, did she not publish, uh, and, and I'm serving on my own memory, Black Kid, did she not publish the Red Record? Correct. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was just about to say. Publ published the Red Record. And um, yeah, so I mean, Published the Red Record, um, like I said, really brought to light um, to the world by going to the UK what was happening with uh, the Negro in America at the time. And it was brought to intentionally to shame America for what it was doing to the Negro. So talking about what was happening with lynchings, and it, it was wildly successful to um, to do that. So she's from Memphis, or she was lived in Memphis. She's from Polly Springs, Mississippi, but. She talked about what happened in Memphis, and Memphis didn't have the lynchings for literally uh, 20 plus more years. So it was highly effective what she did. And what was um, her relationship um, with W.E.B. Du Bois, Michelle? Well, they were contemporaries. Um, he was a little younger than her, but but they basically were born in the same time period. Uh, but they had very different experiences because she was born enslaved in, in the South, and he was born in Massachusetts in the North, um, born free. Um, and he had the opportunity to become highly um, formally educated, and she unfortunately had to leave school when she was only 16. So they, they had the same goals as far as um, you know, equal rights for African Americans. Um, they were both founders of the NAACP, um, and they, uh, you know, they worked in the same space, but they they had slightly different approaches to the same problem. And of course, she did found uh, the NAACP. You, you, we then have to also give her credit, don't we? I mean, the NAACP was really founded. If there was a singular issue that brought that group together, it was lynching, was it not, Dan? So yes, and um, the, the challenge was, and again, that's why you know it started because of that um, and segued from the um, committee of, of 40. Um, but Ida quick, rather quickly stepped away because she felt that they were not as aggressive about um, anti-lynching as they should be. So to Michelle's point, you know, same goal, different philosophies. So she so she stepped away. So how, how long would you say she was actually involved? For how long was she was she actually involved in the NAACP? It, it's unclear exactly how long, um, but it definitely it, it would be based on her writings. It seems like it was definitely less than five years. Um, but I mean, I would just want to say that she, the NAACP um, came together as a result of the 1908 um, race riot that took place in Springfield, Illinois, which was the um, uh, town, you know, associated with Abraham Lincoln. And so, you know, the idea that a lynching would take place in the North, not only in the North, but in Springfield specifically, um, you know, just sort of woke everybody up and said, we have to do something about this. Besides what your great grandmother published, I, I have to wonder, I mean, I don't know other than maybe what Du Bois published also himself. I don't know of, of any more at that time comprehensive um, accounting or documentation 
of that number of lynchings is there she really was the one who chronicled most of those and and put them on the record right dan yeah that's my understanding she, yeah, she was married uh, as far as i know what i've heard and talking to other researchers one america's first investigative journalist right Amen. So lynchings were not investigated before that uh uh one and, and you said something right there dan one of america's first investigative journalist so you said america so we're not just talking about the black press then right she Correct. was right that's important um um michelle you want to expound on that about her as an investigative journalist and being the first Right. Well, she was an investigative journalist, but also the tactics that she was using is now called data journalism, which is where she was um, chronicling exact names, dates, locations, and excuses that were being used um, for lynching. So she um, she she gave you know in today's world it would be called say their names, right? You know she was humanizing the victims. Um, and explaining to people what exactly happened. And more, and more times than not, she found that the majority of the people were not guilty, were, de were definitely not guilty of violating white women. And, in, and many times they were not guilty of any crime. Um, so she you know, showed through her uh, research that, that um, lynching was being used as a form of domestic terrorism and not as a form of punishment for a crime. Um, I wonder, was Dan, was the word terrorism, we know that's what it was, but was that even in the vernacular at that time? I'm sure your great grandmother used the word terror in her writings, didn't she? Right. So I think, um, so again, not being a historian, I don't know that terrorism, um, no, I'm 53, but I don't know that terrorism became a, a popular uh, used word until really 9-11. Yeah, um, yeah, as far as as far as the context of that, but uh, I totally agree with Michelle is that um, lynching was America's first form of domestic terrorism, and that you the, the 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 evolution of America you had slavery you really didn't have lynchings during that time period because we were property <laughs> people don't destroy property, um, but then for you know us for uh, black people the Negro to have power be equal that's not comfortable for uh, racist white people so. You can't control them legally like they, you did before emancipation. So what can you do to control people? Um, it's intimidation and, and terror. So and lynching was a far more egregious crime than people think in that you think, OK, lynching, most people equate with hanging. But it was torture. It was public torture, um, uh, you know, literally, you know, shooting people several times, castrating them in, in some instances, in some instances, uh, burning them alive. And so when you talk about domestic terrorism, that's the, the it gets no more horrific than that. Yeah, I, would, I would just like to add one thing about the press. Um, the white press played a part in this. Um, and now, you know, today, some of them are starting to make statements about, you know, recognizing their role in advertising um, lynchings. They, they um, you know, they encouraged people to go to the lynchings and it was it was celebrated and, and uh, marketed as an event for people to attend. And these were published in white owned newspapers. So they played a role in making it a spectacle. Yeah, no, absolutely. And your great grandmother too, um, Michelle, lived under pain of constant death threats, didn't she herself? Yes, yeah, she, she definitely had her life threatened more than once. And um, that's the reason why she ultimately um, never went back to Memphis after, after her life was threatened. Um, and even while she was still there after her friends were killed, but she was only there for about two and a half months after her friends were killed. Um, and during that time, um, she was visited by the people who owned the streetcar company because she was encouraging the black community to boycott streetcars, boycott white owned businesses. And so so her words were causing economic um, disruption. And so they um, went to her office and threatened her to um, shut up or else. And she documented in her autobiography how she decided to arm herself to protect herself because she knew she was in danger. So, so Dan, your, your great grandmother was carrying. 
<laughs> she was packing. She was carrying. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so, so a gun in, a gun in the Bible. <laughs> um, she, she would have. A so. Amen. A amen. <laughs> I, heard, I heard that. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's important. I mean, we're talking about as we're in the midst of the um, confirmation of the first black woman Supreme Court justice. Um, here is yet another black woman, Michelle, who herself was ahead of her time. Um, probably still does not get the recognition she deserves. And, and wait a minute, you mentioned boycotts. How many people were talking about boycotts before your great-grandmother? Oh, right. Especially uh, black people. So I mean, she was far ahead of her time between boycotts, between, again, 1884, being on the, the rail car and being removed and then suing the railroad. So that's, that's yeah. one. The other thing was the um, not only boycott in Memphis, which was effective of, of the, the, um, the the system. Um, she encouraged people to move. So uh, one of her, her friend's dying words was, "Hey, tell my people to move west. There is no justice for them here." And so the, the white papers would publish that, "Hey, the west is dangerous. Don't go there. It's barren." And she literally visited on her own and investigated Arkansas, and came back and wrote, "Like, no, it's 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 good. Go." And upwards of 6,000 uh, uh, black people moved, which was roughly 10% of the uh, population of, of Memphis. Um, and so that was a, a huge thing. Again, so she, she, what she, what I like about Ida is that she always made the problem much bigger than herself. Yeah. And so her, her thing was not, it's, this isn't going to happen to me any longer. This isn't going to happen to my people. In investigative journalism, economic boycotts removed from the train in Memphis, folks, in 1884. This is before um, Jackie Robinson was removed from the bus and before Rosa Parks was removed in 1955. But wait a minute. I, I think we just figured something else out here, too, Michelle. She's asking people to move. Now, when, when was she encouraging people to leave Memphis and leave the South and go West. About what year did that start? It was actually right after her friends were killed. In, in, uh, they were killed March 9th of 1892. And she actually encouraged people to go to Oklahoma, um, which was a territory at that time. And, um, and so that made a difference because it wasn't part of the United States at that point. She actually went to Oklahoma herself and, and investigated um, the state to see if, if she felt comfortable um, rec you know, recommending that people go there. And I, I personally believe, um, and I'm sure somebody can see the tie maybe between um, the exodus from Memphis and other places in the South to Oklahoma, which might have led to the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, because who who actually moves from other states um, to you know Oklahoma, which was a more open territory at that point? Um, so I, th I think there is a tie. So it, it, the 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 right in terms of the the black community in Tulsa. So exactly. The people who moved to Oklahoma were some of the more enterprising people, more independent minded, and maybe people had a little who had a little bit more means, um, you know, because you had to have something in order to be able to move, um, you know, so, um, you know, and then people moved as far away as California, you know, Colorado, some other places, um, even farther west. Well, and right, and and obviously the influence on Tulsa, but but the other hypothesis I was going to put out there too, in general, sounds like your great grandmother planted the seeds of what would later become the Great Black Migration. It was the same argument; it was just later. We got to get out of the South. There's opportunity, and folks still killing us. She was doing that before the 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 Great Black Migration on the books of. <laughs> you know, uh, the mid 1900s. She was doing that before then, right, Dan? Yes, um, so agreed uh, time-wise. The, the reference is a little different in that um, she moved to Chicago um, in, what, 1894. Um, and so then, you know, with seeing, and that, that was her point was like, hey, the North is not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than what's happening in the South. So let's have you move. And so she also worked with um, 
with churches, with other organizations to provide that transition. Because again, as Michelle said, you, you know, you, you're, you're coming with essentially nothing, a, a suitcase and that's it. And so she was, so she was influential by not only writing about it and saying, hey, come up here, but providing a support system for people to make that transition. How clearly a dynamic woman, uh, uh, Michelle, how did she become so influential? What was it about her um, that made her so significant at that time? And, and even as a as a woman, now, granted, I'm sure she faced whatever sexism there was in her day, but she still was able to get through as much as she did probably should have gotten through a lot more more folks should listen to your great-grandmother but how, what was it about her that enabled her to do that i mean from from my research um and in writing um you know several books about her including i'd be the queen and i'd be lost boys the truth um she she was just very straightforward her writing style i mean she was a journalist so that gave her a platform um, and in her journalism, she defied social expectations and she wrote what's considered, quote, hard news versus what, you know, most women were tended to be writing, which was more writing about sort of um, domestic kind of issues as far as, you know, decorating and child rearing and cooking and things like that. And so that step set her apart from other female journalists. And then, I mean, she, she was very biting and very straightforward and very, she used her platform to... Um, it exposed issues that affected the Black community in ways that were uh, maybe more straightforward and um, focused and critical than many of her contemporaries. And so she gained a following um, and and was you know elevated to a national status even before um, she, you know she started writing about lynching specifically. And now, Dan, this was your. Uh, father's grandmother. Yeah, so the, the lineage is, um, so yes, and a, a one minute overview is um, I'd have married Ferdinand Barnett, who's a prominent uh, civil rights attorney in Chicago at the time, right. owner of Chicago's first black newspaper, the Conservatory. And so he was a widow, and he had two children from his previous marriage. Um, so Ida and Ferdinand had four children. Um, the youngest one being Alfreda. And also, so Ida had um, two boys, two girls. The first girl was Ida Jr., which again, just um, you gotta love Ida B. Wells <laughs> to have a junior. And to hyphenate her name, which was not that popular back then as well. Um, but then her, her youngest, um, Alfreda, she had after age 40, which was unusual for the time as well. So, and then Alfreda's got five children, one of them being Donald. Uh, Donald's got three children, you got Michelle, David, and Daniel. So I have to, to to ask, did your um did your father have the opportunity to meet his grandmother, Ida B. Wells? No, she actually passed um a year before he was born. Oh, okay. Okay. So Michelle, how was how was this? I'm always curious, those who are uh descendants of such great people, um how this was handed down to you. I, I once asked Martin III when he realized how great his father was. He was 10 when he was killed. You know, you don't really know everything at 10. And he talked about, you know, reaching his 20s. And he went, he was sitting, he was visiting Hosea Williams. And I'd asked him a question, Martin, when did you really get really who your father was? And he said he was sitting with Hosea Williams and Hosea Williams said to Martin tearfully, Martin III tearfully, he said, Martin, your father overcame the love of power and the love of money. And in, in just those simple words, Martin III said it crystallized for him his father's humility and dedication to his people and what he was really about. So I always, I always like to like to ask people, um, you know, well, first of all, when, how old were you when you guys like, Hey, wait a minute, 
Ida B. Wells was my great grandmother. When when did that hit you, Michelle? Well, we always knew that we were related to her. Um, our grandmother, who was Ida's youngest daughter, was very um, involved in our lives. We knew her very well, as well as her other daughter, Ida Jr. Um, and so it was just something that we always knew growing up. But I would say for me, um, I, I recognized, I had a better perspective of exactly uh, how much my great grandmother's um, accomplishments were um, once I reached my early 20s, I would say, and it was when I was becoming um, into my own, you know, when it came to my career and being in the world as a woman and not a girl. Um, and, you know, that just gave me some more perspective of like what my great grandmother had to endure as a woman, because I was having my own challenges as a woman 100 years later. Um, you know, so I started becoming curious about how she navigated um, the world as a black woman dealing with racism and sexism and living in a time that was much more dangerous than I than any of us have experienced. Um, so that's when I became more curious and, and started um, doing more research and, and sort of, uh, you know, answering questions for myself on, on how she uh, managed to accomplish what she did in the time that she lived in. And what about you, Dan? When, when did you when did you get it or did you kind of always know? So, no, um, I'd say, so you always, always knew, but I guess when, you, when did you get, so it's two different questions. We always knew. Um, and I'd say that I got it probably in, in my twenties um, and speaking to, starting to speak as a uh, speaker at a friend who was at a school and she asked me to come speak as the descendant of Ida B. Wells. And so then I got it and I just got better name recognition in Chicago than most places because there's the housing development that had been named after her. And so um, there's a difference between name recognition and actually knowing what she did. So people be like, oh, Ida B. Wells, I know that name, but they, they don't have a full appreciation or knowledge of what she did. So after that, I'd say I started to do some more, um, you know, reading and uh, so the, the journal that I did kept, um, Again, Alfreda, her daughter, was what uh, turned it into the autobiography. And so that's when I read the autobiography, I'd say in my early 20s, and got a, a, a more full understanding of what she did and appreciation for what she did and being a descendant of her. Michelle, and I appreciate you saying, um, you know, what you have had to endure as a woman. Um, how does your great grandmother's experience inform you even today uh, in in your comings and goings in life? And is is there any is there anything especially that you carry with you from her memory or from your memory of her that kind of keeps you going every day and keeps you inspired? Well, yes. I mean. Uh, not only am I a woman the same as my great grandmother, but I also um, have defied some societal expectations when it comes to people to have this idea that as a woman, you're supposed to get married by age, between age 25 and 30 um, and have children after by a certain age. And, you know, just all these kind of ideas of what you're supposed to do in a timeline. Um, and I wasn't interested in following that timeline. And so when I became more aware of how my great grandmother, who had to deal with even more, I'm sure, um, social pressure, when it came to that, I felt like, okay, I'm not, I'm not the only one. Um, and maybe that, and maybe I get this from my great grandmother, my, my desire to be more independent. I also learned when I was reading through her writings that she loved to travel. Um, and so I'm like, maybe I get that from her, you know, too. And so just to sort of, um, you know, this, desire to kind of live your own life on your own terms and not sort of follow what other people think you should do, um, you know, was uh, very comforting to me to see that she did, did that as well. Um, and then when it came to just 
ignoring criticism and, you know, in listening to her own voice and following her own path. Um, it's not easy. I mean, what she was dealing with was, you know, we, we revere her today and we are inspired by her today. But I think we also need to recognize the level of strength that it took for her to, um, you know, just sort of block out, you know, the haters, if you want to call it that, you know, and, and just kind of stay focused on her own mission and her own goal and her own um, truth. And, and And what about you, Dan? How does she inform your your daily life? Uh, are there times you have to make a decision about something? You say, well, I'm going to do what Ida B. Wells would have done. Uh, or do you ever say to people, you know, don't mess with me. I'm Ida B. Wells. Great grandson. <laughs> I think that's, that's what I would do. <laughs> well, I, I've never done that. I, I, I don't know if it would work, uh, but I, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, the, um, it wasn't until probably my late twenties where I had a conversation with my father about the values that she passed down. And there were, were several that were intentional. And I do, um, a keynote speech in a workshop that I developed and I use Wells as an acronym, which is be wise with your choices, be excellent with your actions, live with integrity, lead with courage and speak with passion. And so the, you know, you've always got choice. So make the best choice that, that that's there for you. And if you can, again, what she did is make that choice broader than yourself. You don't make, take it personally. It's like, what's best, not only for me, what's best for society or, or, or my people. Um, excellent with your actions is we are always taught to do your best. Um, and I remember my uncle challenging, uh, telling a story about challenging my grandmother about, you know, whatever career he wanted to do. And, uh, mentioned some things that may be considered menial, and she was like, "I don't care what what your career is. Do your best. Um, so be excellent." And Ida, if you ever read her writing, she was just a tr tremendous writer. Was excellent. Um, and then yeah. live live with integrity is you know knowing what's right and doing what's right, even if you don't feel like it, even if nobody's looking, even if your life is on the line, <laughs> um, which goes hand in hand with courage. To me, that to have true integrity, you have to have courage. You have to have the courage, as Michelle said, to ignore what other people are, are saying or, or thinking and, and do your thing. And then speak with passion. In order to speak with passion, you have to live with passion. Um, so find what you're passionate about, which Ida happened to be passionate about justice. And the biggest injustice during her, her lifetime, during that time frame, was lynching. So um, I, I espouse all of those. A couple of other ones are the value for um, education and the value for family. Um, uh, for my grandmother, she's got, again, the five uh, children. All of them went to school, went to college, had advanced degrees. The 15 grandchildren, all of us attended college. Um, more than half of us, I'm not in that half, Michelle is, had advanced degrees. And so going to college was normal for us. Not that that's necessary for anybody, but that was normal in our family. What are you going to do after college? And then uh, the family structure um, is important. And so that, that was something that I'd experienced it as that I'd experienced as a young girl. And that was passed on to us as well, the value for family. I wonder, too, if, you know, in all these journalism schools we have in this country around the world, I wonder how much Ida B. Wells is a part of those curricula in those schools. Very little. Um, and that was what. Uh, um, influenced me to edit the first two books that I did that incorporate Ida's original writings. I took it out of the archives and created books so that, uh, with the idea that um, journalism schools would incorporate it into the curriculum. And um, when I was on my mission to do that, um, I found out that very few journalism schools um, incorporate her, which I found shocking and, um, you know, just sort of disappointing because you know you have she was the the, the a pioneer when it came to data journalism and her journalism was so influential when it came to social change um and so for people to go all the way through journalism school and not learn um about one of the most significant journalists in the, in the world in our history um is really a disservice to um journalism students uh, maybe things have changed in recent years, but but it, even as recently as maybe five years ago, um, I, I I know that it's it, her work is not really incorporated. So we do need to make we have to make. <coughs> um, 
I think it's and important. What's, right, what's interesting, Reverend Mark, just because um, it's funny, Michelle and I talk about certain things, but um, being on a panel right, is, is enlightening for me because um, I've met so many, um, especially African American and white women, who the reason that they do know about Ida B. Wells is because they went, uh, they were, they took a journalism class or their major was journalism. Um, and so, you know, while, while she still needs to be um, included in each and every curriculum, it's it's still awesome to see her inspiration um, to journalists who, who, who are two people, especially women who have taken journalism classes. Right? Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And, and listen, vigilance on that effort is obviously necessary because we are now in the era of folks trying to use uh, CRT as an argument to remove our history from all levels of education. So we need to we need to ramp this up, lest um, those who experienced Ida B. Wells, as you described, another generation misses out on those and those who've yet to experience her don't ever get there. So we got to keep that up. Um, as we get ready to go, let me ask you both. Is there what are the other things uh, going forward in the future, in the, in the days and weeks and months and months and years to come? What are the things that you would like to further see happen to uh, honor, commemorate, memorialize and educate everyone about your great grandmother? Anything you all are planning? No, well, one of, I mean, what we just talked about, I think it's very important to incorporate information, not only about our great grandmother, but about black people, about black history, about our experience and perspectives. It, this is American history. And for people to act like it's, you know, just sort of, a, you know, marginalized, you know, insignificant information is, is um, you know, insulting on, on, on multiple levels. Um, you know, black people have been in this country for 400 years, 400 plus years. And and this country would not be what it is without us, without our contributions. And so we have to be part of the curriculum in every um, every um, discipline, not just history, but you know, in science, in math, in every discipline you can think of, Black people contributed, and we have to be incorporated into the curriculum. And I think once that happens, that would impact so many other things, because people can't do something if they don't know about it. And so we have to make sure that people are exposed to and influenced by this information, inspired by it. And, yeah. and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so I, I, I agree. And just statistically, when you look at things, um, so not again, to per Michelle's point, it's not just about Ida B. Wells, it's about recognizing um, uh, black or, uh, people of color and women. Uh, so there is mo a monument uh, that was just unveiled last year here in Chicago of for Ida B. Wells. And hearing the numbers about monuments in the US. There are over 5,000 monuments in the U.S. Roughly 8%, about 400, are of women, and a fraction of that is women of color. And so, just the 8% of women, right? And so, when you look at our our country's history, women have contributed, but um, their recognition and appreciation is nowhere near what it should be. So, just to continue to have um, that dialogue and uh, to um, have that recognition and awareness increase for the contributions of women and people of color. No, that's very important. And there's a Barbie doll, right? <laughs> and yeah. we know about we know about images and and self images that our young people need to see. That that's great. Yes, well, um, Ida B. Wells is, is uh, part of the Inspiring Women series with Mattel, um, and she's one of the first. Uh, I think it's, I can't remember if it's the fourth or fifth um, um, Barbie doll that is uh, created in that series that um, of, of Black women um, in that series. And so, you know, even with within Doll Land, um, <laughs> you know, it's, we're at the beginning stages of having African American women. Uh, represented not just African American women, just any doll, but historically based people who are based on real people. I mean, dolls that are based on real people 
Um, there are only four. Um, so we need, I mean, within Mattel. So we, you know, I'm sure they even recognize they're at the beginning stages of creating dolls that honor real women um, and in order to introduce uh, children at a young age to who these women were um, and hopefully, you know, see themselves and be inspired by them. Is is to me, so when I was growing up, they, we had superhero figurines. So it's just another superhero figurine to me. This is, you know, uh, Marvel Universe, DC. I mean, these are superheroes. That was, that was <laughs> a, action figures, Reverend Mark. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she got a superhero thing. That's right. Uh, any, um, any movies or anything like that in the... In the there's actually, Daniel, I mean, there's actually a documentary film coming out, which will premiere um, April 19th in Memphis, and, and Dan's going to be at the premiere. Um, it's, it was done by the um, University of Memphis. Um, so that that's very, that's coming out just in a couple of weeks. And um, the PBS station here in Chicago, WTTW, created a documentary film which came out last year, which is available online for free. If people just uh, Google WTTW Ida B. Wells, um, it, it'll come up. And so that's um, for free. Um, and there was another documentary film made in the 1980s. And people always ask when a feature film is gonna come out and we have to say, we don't know. Um, it's a process, it's a very big process to create a, doc a feature versus a documentary film. It's a whole different uh, ball game. Right. Well, 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 hopefully we'll get there. Um, of course, folks, these are two of the great grandchildren of Ida B. Wells, Barnett, Michelle and Dan Duster. Now, again, the books are out. Ida B. Wells, Voice of Truth and Ida B. the Queen, the Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells. Now, this is a this is an urgent time when we need to be buying more books as they are taking the history out of all of our education systems. So if you want to give a gift, all right, that's a different kind. You know, I know folks like to give gifts and stuff. You can't read clothes and other stuff like that, but you can read a book. Uh, uh, I'm just saying, folks, we need to shift our priorities in terms of what we're sharing with one another. All right. And I know folks have the Kindles and the iPads. You can download it all that and just read to your heart's desire. So support what Michelle has written. Dan, from your point of view, you say you do workshops. How can people find you so you can show up and talk and get some folks straight? <laughs> so you can Google me. I've, I've got a website that um, is under construction. For whatever reason, it, it's not up. It, it should have been up. Um, so I, 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 I'm a financial advisor, so I had to um, take it down for compliance issues. But um, because it has to be go, go through our compliance uh, for the financial industry. But it was approved and it, it should be up. Um, so if, if, if look, and if it's not up, when you do look the next day, hopefully we'll be up then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan Duster. Well, that's uh, danduster.com. Danduster.com, Dan wonderful. Right. Uh, and of course, um, um, Michelle, um, uh, uh, your website is mid mid right no, no, ML, as in Larry. Oh, I'm sorry, M, it's ML, I'm sorry, I can't see. ML, MLD is in Michelle L. Dust, MLD rights. Yeah. All right. Uh, right, W R I T E S rights. <laughs> and, and it's also on Twitter. She's on Twitter at Michelle Duster. And then Dan is on Twitter uh, at, um, at Dan, Dan Duster Speaks. Yep. He's not as active on Twitter <laughs> as Michelle is. Which also was kind of sacrilegious because your your, your great grandmother was a journalist. She would have used Twitter every day. So you need to, you know, Dan, you need to, we need to get you. <laughs> All right, represent, so. represent your family. So uh, now nah, I'm just messing with you, brother. But uh, um, we appreciate you both. Uh, you, you both are great. Thank you for sharing this history and this story. We checked a lot of boxes today. First, investigative journalist, one of the first to call for economic boycotts, one of the first to inspire uh, African Americans to to migrate from the south so yeah uh, this this great hero this great woman did a lot for our community and our people and we need to lift her up and we're thankful to her family for helping us to lift her up but we have a duty not to just leave this to this family folks we have a duty to lift up all of these ancestors 
without whom none of us would be here. So if there was, if there were any lives saved by Ida B. Wells writing and exposing, exposing of lynching back in those days, that might've been a member who was saved, who was a member of one of our own families, an ancestor. Couldn't save everyone, but imagine how people she was able to save by shining a light on what was going on. We all know Parliament Funkadella. That's what that song is really about. People don't know what it's about. <laughs> flashlight. That's nothing. She was flashlight before Parliament. Hello? I think I just said something. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> appreciate you both, the great grandchildren, Michelle and Dan Duster of the great Ida B. Wells Barnett. Thank you both for joining us on Make It Plain. Thank you, Reverend. Reverend thank you, and thank thank you for what you do. Um, it, it's powerful. It's necessary, and we appreciate and support you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.